¿Por dónde empiezas si quieres cambiar el mundo? Y a la velocidad a lo que se mueve todo. ¿Cómo consigues que el cambio sea para bien? ¿Empezarías por conseguir que un país logre la autosuficiencia energética? By helping people of uh, NGOs to be as uh, productive as uh, businesses. Maybe putting an end to uh, pollution. Would your legacy be protecting the past for future generations? or giving hope of those that uh, lost it so that through their talents and skills, they can start a new life. Big changes such as this may start by something as small as asking better questions. The type of question that will make you think of what you have never thought before, providing unexpected answers, helping solve some of the big challenges, the type of questions we uh, ask ourselves in EY. So how should we start if we want to change the world? You start here. Hola, muy buenos días. Hi, good morning and welcome everyone to our first seminar for our customers in the salmon industry in southern Chile. This has been organized by our EY Patagonia uh, team supported by the uh, Consejo del Salmón Salmon Board. Uh, EY Patagonia, it's a project that we have that began a couple of years ago main purpose is to give our customers in the southern uh, Chile the necessary support and experience from all our service lines uh, in one single place uh, together with a direct focus on a work that will allow providing the best uh, synergies and performance for managing companies so in, in, in southern uh, Chile. To that end, our lines of audit, finances, business consulting, con taxes, uh, uh, people uh, consulting, aim at supporting you in your different industries, and especially the salmon industry. The idea is to help you capitalize your opportunities, face better challenges, commercial operations, the regulatory uh, requirements. I'd like to thank the participation of our customers today, uh, the partners in EY2, the leading uh, partner of, uh, in, from Norway, who will be presenting today, the Salmon Board. I'd like to thank them for their participation and all the EY Patagonia members that help, help us in, in, in doing this. This year, more than ever, the agenda has been focused on COVID-19 and all the effects this uh, pandemic affecting us all has uh, uh, had on the salmon industry. So in this event, I would like to disseminate the main challenges, trends in, the, in terms of sustainability, some uh, IFRS, uh, tax issues and uh, mega trends and challenges of the industry worldwide. It is always uh, better having this information in advance. Avoiding facing them in a saddened manner uh, without knowing uh, what the situation is in children around the world. So let's talk, let's discuss, let's identify opportunities on these topics and having an impact on this uh, such an important industry for Chile. I know this will be very fruitful. So I welcome all of you.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is the executive director of the uh, Salmon Industry, a new uh, organization formed uh, last year by four Banco uh, Chile, Moic, Salmones, Aysen, that, that together account for 50% of the salmon industry in Chile. Let me first thank EY Chile for the invitation to uh, chair this uh, seminar and welcome all, the, all of you that are visiting uh, at the Salmon Express and the EY Chile website. Like to let you know that during the event, we'll be speaking in English and Spanish. At the bottom, there's a, a icon to select the language. We'll be receiving, uh, taking questions in the WhatsApp in the, on the screen. The, this seminar is called Challenges and Opportunities, a Comprehensive View of the Salmon Industry. So I'd like to share our view on this industry. First, opportunities. Uh, according to uh, UN estimates, the world population will grow by 2 billion people in the next uh, uh, 30 years, reaching uh, 10, 10 billion in 2050. FAO, UN FAO says that the requirement of protein should grow by 40% globally. This greater demand, uh, along with the growing trend of the population, uh, to improve health through better uh, food uh, and uh, uh, protection of the environment makes the healthy food production more is more important. And so we believe uh, salmon industry is key to face this challenge with a very healthy protein. And of course, in a sustainable manner. Thus, a huge opportunity lies ahead. Chile is a small country and open to the world with competitive advantages in some activities, such as in production of uh, food. We export over 16 billion uh, 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 US dollars in, in worth of food. Salmon, we're exporting $5 billion worth of salmon, the second world largest after Norway, 25% of the world production. In terms of our exports, salmon is the second place after copper, we have free trade agreements so with nearly 90% of the uh, world population, and that's an opportunity. If as a country, we uh, try to increase our export capacity, we can speed up uh, uh, one of our growth drivers. And of course, given the uh, COVID crisis, we can help uh, re economic reactivation and, and improve the growth in different regions, particularly in southern Chile. We're convinced that the salmon industry has a huge potential to, con to continue to contribute to the development and life quality of people, be the driving force for job creation, our suppliers, and developing our human talent. Thus, our board was put together last year to uh, get together on, a, on a, a clear goal, improving the development of all the production chain uh, with good uh, environmental protective practices, uh, promoting innovation, communities, and respecting the environment. From there, we see the challenges faced by the industry, and we have five major areas. First, relationship with the environment and communities. We know that the activities are developing in, in the cultural and environmental area where we want to be respectful of that. We want to strengthen the trust and, uh, and the relationship with all the communities and stakeholders where we operate using uh, ongoing dialogue. Second, protection of the environment and sustainability. We are aware that the future depends on how we protect uh, our planet. Salmon is a healthy protein source, uh, and we know we can do this in a responsible manner, protecting the environment, guaranteeing high environmental uh, and social standards. The commitment uh, uh, with, with, we have with uh, sustainable uh, production, we've joined, uh, uh, we have uh, external assessments, international certifications, which are very reputable in the industry. Third of all, the need of disseminating the reality of salmon industry. Chile is the second uh, producer in the world. We believe we have to discuss our reality, contribute to for people to learn about us, uh, processes, how these processes have, uh, in, uh, are including more in, in technology and innovation and the contribution they make to the region and the country, the ups and downs. So, so 
This is a very good opportunity for this. Fourth of all, the contribution to discussion of public policies. As an organization, we want to build uh, regulations that besides protecting the environment can drive the growth of the industry to improve uh, our industry. We're making contributions to that discussion. And last but not least, science, research, and development. We believe that the scientific understanding of our environment, it's important when considering animal health and sustainability, oceanographic climate, health, and environmental conditions are different from other producers. Thus, from our board, we promote and will lead research and development as well as the adoption of the best practices available supported by scientific uh, basis and making innovations. In closing, uh, we'll have an opportunity as a country which we cannot neglect. We have special conditions uh, that will give us a competitive advantages. Uh, we can promote growth in southern Chile. We can contribute to the problem of uh, food challenges. We have to do it right. High standards in a sustainable, economical, and environmentally sound manner. With that, we can find the best way to realize this promising future for the whole country. Let me now go into the presentations. We have an uh, important uh, guest, and I would like to give you the first lecturer or speaker, Eric Mo, leader, leader of the aquaculture leader in uh, EY Norway, our vast experience in uh, uh, ocean transportation, energy, real estate, uh, tourism, uh, venture capital, family businesses. He's a public accountant from the Nor Norwegian uh, School of Economics, has a master's degree in Harvard and other universities. So welcome, Eric. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, honored to, uh, to be able to join you this morning and good morning to you. I'm uh, speaking to you from uh, Bergen, Norway, which is kind of the, the fjord capital of, of Norway and uh, the gateway to um, the salmon industry in Norway um, on, on the coastal uh, west coast of Norway. So um, uh, I will uh, uh, bring with you uh, some uh, experiences and some views uh, from, uh, let's say, the, uh, my many years within working with the Norwegian aquaculture sector, but uh, also uh, uh, during the last 20 years been uh, visiting and working with uh, aquaculture in uh, around the world in all the kind of areas uh, uh, being producers of uh, of salmon and samoids so including uh, Chile which I've been uh, visiting uh, many many times during the years so um, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, on the presentation of our, if we go to the next page here. Um, uh, my uh, views uh, will also be able to uh, be found in uh, what is now the fifth uh, edition of the Norwegian Aquaculture Analysis, and uh, has which is also uh, been extended now to look at uh, aquaculture in other geographical areas and also to ex be extended to look at fisheries because we see there are kind of synergies and complementary kind of uh, uh, dimensions into the natural fisheries as well uh, on this so going to the uh, showing you the next slide uh, on my presentation uh, when we look at the aquaculture industry we are not only looking at uh, the what we call the production or the harvesting uh, uh, part of it. We look at the whole industry, and uh, it. I must say that during these twenty years working with the, the industry, it's been a tremendous journey to see uh, the masses of competences and also investments that has been uh, then 
uh, rooted into the salmon industry. And uh, in many ways, salmon industry has been and is the kind of, uh, you might say, the pilot and the driver of competence and uh, innovation, because uh, we've been lucky enough to have a good uh, development in the salmon price, which has then made innovation investments and also attracted people to this industry. Uh, and in this way, uh, brought uh, farming and harvesting further. And as you see here, these are in, in billion uh, knocks uh, at, at, but you see that, of course, the greatest turnovers are in production and distribution, sale of, of, of salmon. But the EBITDA, the, the profits are of course generated in the, the production element. But we see that both on the um, industry of suppliers uh, uh, and also biotechnology, uh, a lot of investments has been made, but also of course on well boats in the distribution part is has been an attractive and growing industry. And uh, uh, both for Norway, but also for Chile, uh, salmon industry has become a major employer um, in the uh, national economy. So um, if you, we look at the next slide, uh, we see here uh, the development over the years, uh, both in, uh, in volumes of slaughter, but also uh, and also, also the, the total industry. And we, we see here that uh, during, let's say, since 2016, uh, uh, the increase kind of flattened out because of uh, problems with diseases and mortality, uh, lice problems in Norway as well. And, uh, and this, uh, so during kind of the period from 16 to 18, it was quite flat uh, um, as on the, on the volumes, um, 15 to, to 18. And then we got an increase, uh, partly also because of uh, price uh, increases. But during this uh, period, uh, the problems uh, not only kind of cut back on um, on turnovers and volumes, of, as you will see now from the next uh, slide, this also influenced the cost. And of course, uh, 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 we can see here that the cost of goods sold uh, uh, did uh, increase rapidly uh, uh, over these years. And uh, also, uh, OPEX and personnel costs. I, I, I often see there has been during these years in the Norwegian salmon industry, uh, a more it, ha, it has become more capital intensive, intensive in the way that uh, lots more of investments has been done on both on sea, on the installations on land and in, in sea, but of, of course also in the distribution part with the well boats and the servicing of the boats, which has become more sophisticated. However, as you see, uh, regardless of the cost uh, increase, uh, uh, the revenue or, or this, uh, the sales price of salmon increased, uh, as you see, to a new level here in 2016 and, and, uh, and further on which has uh, even regardless of a high cost uh, generated these margins, which has then, uh, I would say also given rise to the next wave, because as you can see you now from the next slide that we will, I, I, I have here, uh, uh, we can also click and have a, a show the comparison now on, uh, on this. We see that, uh, even though it's kind of uh, it's split uh, put together here, uh, we see that uh, there has been some uh, uh, kind of uh, structural changes in the salmon industry, where uh, where you see the balance between the revenues and also the margins has been changing, and uh, we see especially on transportation on sea in the well boats that marches has come down. Uh, sea farming is still the, the, the greatest uh, kind of 
both in total figures, absolute figures, but also in margins uh, and uh, total revenues, the greatest part of the value chain. But uh, in our report, you will can study uh, and see how uh, the structural part of uh, the industry is changing and the two areas who has generated most kind of increase in profits uh, the last years uh, is now uh, the supplier industry and of equipment and also on the biotechnology side uh, and i th think the latter one has to do of course with the challenges on diseases and lice so we're bringing us one uh, step further on the slides uh, we can see uh, that uh, uh, this combination of challenges uh, to increase volumes and also the favorable profits has uh, made a kind of a big uh, eager in the industry to try to continue growth and to uh, use innovation to find new ways of dealing both with the present challenges uh, but also to increase volumes. But of course, uh, the, the favorable price uh, pattern has, of course, uh, been dri driven by uh, the steady increase in global demands. And we all know there are um, uh, aspects as uh, increased uh, standard of living uh, and uh, uh, and an increasing middle class especially in the uh, emerging markets and also a more health conscious uh, population where uh, omega 3 and the uh, and the favorable kind of uh, production carbon footprints of salmon has been uh, kind of driving uh, uh, the demand side so uh, the kind of the initiatives we now see we have kind of categorized in four areas. Yeah, we say one thing is to look at the larger post malt in order to uh, reduce uh, mortality and in this that sense both increase volumes and uh, also reduce mortality. We also see a great uh, <clears throat> focus on knowledge based fish farming and here we see uh, in Norway. Uh, technology and knowledge from the offshore industry and the sub uh, subsea oil industry being employed into the uh, fish farming, both on uh, on digital kind of big data gathering. We see that in uh, how uh, we are monitoring uh, and managing the installations in a more kind of digital way. And we also see that over to the feed side uh, where you are controlling the feed and also, of course, the uh, the sustainability of the feed with regards to uh, excess feeding to reduce that uh, on an environmental side, but also to, uh, to, to based on the knowledge that you become what you eat. And that's for humans and that's also for salmon. So the content and the formula of the feed uh, has the, is a great consciousness now to see that that has a great impact on the quality of the salmon, both uh, uh, the quality of the kind of meat, but also on the uh, health care of the salmon. And that has brought us into now kind of looking at how can we increase the supply side? As I said, the, the demand side has been growing steadily. And uh, of course, uh, a great financial resources has now been employed into looking at new alternative production technologies. And looking at the next slide now, um, we can see that you can actually divide this into maybe let's say three main areas. You see uh, uh, in the sea, the conventional fish farming, we still think that will be the, the major um, part of fish farming. We have the open pens, but I think personally that semi-closed and closed uh, um, uh, than pens or containers in the in sea will uh, be 
kind of the future of Norwegian fish farming. And I think going, let's say, five or 10 years ahead, you will, will look back to the days when you had open pens where excess feed and pollution from, let's say, uh, waste from the fish were just kind of dropped into the sea. That will be past history. So in, in that sense, uh, to have a sustainable fish farming, uh, we think that uh, semi-conventional or closed uh, containments will be the future in the in sea. And then we have land-based uh, facilities. And of course, uh, in a way, you might say COVID has accelerated this in, in two ways. Uh, we see that uh, RAS technology has been uh, gaining a lot of interest and risk capital uh, and uh, the, uh, the the kind of uh, the problems we see with traveling and with global trades also on a global political uh, kind of uh, map uh, has raised the interest for local production closer to the consumers and of course that is the uh, great advantage with the RAS facility. You can actually, regardless of uh, the, the being located on the coastal lines and in areas where you have uh, kind of, uh, waters uh, being used for, for salmon, you can actually uh, go ahead and, and produce close to the, the, to the um, consumers. I think this also has, a, uh, might also have a, can also have a, quality premium in the way that if this is uh, uh, you are succeeding in, in, in on this land-based installation you can also have be showing that you have a more sheltered uh, farming environment and controllable environment from a pollution or, or kind of uh, uh, kind of sustainable uh, Ooh, invention yeah. So um, uh, the other part, which is mainly being driven by the uh, strategic kind of already uh, fish farming companies, is then the offshore installations. And in Norway, we are now having some great pilot installations on offshore, which uh, is uh, still in a very kind of early stage. Uh, but uh, there are great expectations on this as to uh, the potential uh, of, of these large offshore and sea-based installations, as they will not be under the same restrictions as the fjord-based conventional pens with regards to licenses and such. So uh, going uh, one uh, slide ahead, uh, we see here, uh, as I said, uh, here is just showing uh, the increase now on identified plan and uh, plan capacity of in million tons, uh, uh, which has just been exploding the last three four years. Um, and uh, uh, even though this uh, very few installations are actually operational. Uh, uh, I think that, let's say, the number of projects actually being now uh, under installation and uh, then will be in a pilot phase. And also the uh, access to risk capital has increased the expectation and the likelihood of you getting a kind of a breakthrough on this technology. And uh, as you see, uh, uh, lots of them are actually in, in waters uh, where today you have uh, which are kind of today you have access to also uh, seawater i think when this uh, technology has proven you will then find uh, this ex uh, this to be exported to other areas where in uh, of great population in asia uh, and uh, uh, other uh, let's say uh, large uh, growing markets, which um, today are serviced by export from uh, from uh, conventional uh, production areas like Norway. So going one uh, slide still ahead, uh, uh, I think that to summarize here, uh, the uh, 
as I said, uh, we are going through a very uh, kind of development with a lot of capital being employed into the industry, but also a lot of knowledge. And this is knowledge uh, being um, a kind of transferred from um, sophisticated offshore and subsea uh, environments, but also from academic areas. We see that the industry has come grown for a rural uh, diversified uh, industry to a knowledge intensive and uh, high tech uh, industry. And, and that gives great expectations uh, to the future. Yes. Thank you, Eric, for your interesting presentation on uh, trends and challenges, innovation, and how agriculture is uh, growing around the world. Next, I will give you Mario Rodriguez. Uh, he's the office managing partner of the Patagonia office in Puerto Montt. As a uh, uh, background on finance, on finances, capital markets, account, he has an MBA of Tulane and he has been working in the EY London office. Today, he's focused on the real estate, agribusiness, and aquaculture. Welcome, Mario. Thank you, Joanna, uh, for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank Eric for, for taking this time and sharing uh, with us uh, part of this uh, interesting report you have built on aquaculture in Norway. We will be discussing now, but quite briefly, are some of the challenges of uh, certain international organizations uh, have underpinned in terms of uh, financial and non-financial reporting. Uh, this, the, well, one of the questions is who will create the new reporting framework for companies and what's the status? I could say that, so, September 2020, the IFRS Council issued a consultation document aiming at the feedback uh, to address the need of aligning financial reports with sustainability reports. Since many times financial information is not consistent with the sustainability reports. Second of all, it aims at defining the role of these uh, IFRS council could have in developing a new, uh, more integrated uh, reporting framework and assess whether there should be a board that in a way could uh, consolidate the different frameworks in terms of uh, sustainability reporting. Yet another interesting issue addressed by this document is the concept of uh, performance, a corporate performance. Uh, not so long ago, companies were measured uh, by their ability to generate uh, future cash flows, EBITDA, or a performance in a given year. But that has been changed over time. And this document also refers to the fact that the uh, value creation over the long term, financial performance of a, of a company will not be uh, besides about financial performance, we'll be measuring other variables, so, such as social dimensions and environmental dimensions. Thus, we uh, can say that there is a, uh, a growing demand for standardization of financial information, and that this information is being required by different stakeholders, such as investors, uh, banking industry, um, uh, capital markets and and consumers who uh, are really interested on in knowing and having traceability of the products they buy. Thus, the document uh, has a, a an updated uh, approach of uh, financial and non-financial information reporting of the capital market and aims at, at um, uh, what could be for the future, including a multiple stakeholders approach where uh, 
the impact of companies is analyzed on the company, on, on the economy, on the environment, and on people. Last but not least, uh, we could say that financial and non-financial reporting requires a holistic view where the reports are more consistent uh, among each other and having a, uh, a more integrated uh, view. So putting all that together uh, with uh, a potential issue we could face over the short term, I've included two things which are addressed quite briefly here. First, a, uh, a potential change in uh, of a fishing agriculture uh, law. If you read of the potential uh, bills in, in the agenda, uh, more requirements are being made on owners using those concessions as to the removal of wastes and restoration of a sea bottom. Let me say that um, some uh, may compare this to what happened a few years ago with the law 20,551, uh, the mining law uh, that, uh, that uh, set out that the companies had to build uh, uh, a mine closure plan. So the challenge I'm, I'm sharing with you here is what our industry uh, companies are doing and what regulators could require in terms of the definition of restoration and rehabilitation plans for uh, sea bottom. This may require a legal obligation and uh, a greater assessment in financial statements. And the structuring of green loans. Uh, uh, some companies in, in, in the industry with uh, high standards in terms of uh, environment and sustainability initiatives and able to structure uh, these green loans and some of the challenges uh, from the point of, point of view of IFRS and financial reporting is traceability of, uh, of uh, the use uh, of these uh, funds of these money and uh, disclosure of uh, financial statements and, and other reports in terms of the commitment uh, uh, with all compliance with the green covenants. And in closing, some questions that may be interesting uh, to discuss among our industry, if whether the uh, sustainability strategy is adequate, how this uh, strategy can be translated into a sustainability report, who are the main users of uh, sustainability information? Uh, do, is there any uh, 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 assurance uh, extent of the sustainability reporting? Uh, the, the systems uh, uh, are consistent with current and future requirements. Is there a, a, an internal control environment for the sustainability report? So back to you, Joanna. Thank you, Mario. Um, I'd like to offer the floor to Eleni Almeida. She is a sustainability and corporate governance. Uh, she's been here for four years developing strategies of integ to integrate uh, social governance and environmental aspects in companies uh, that end up in, in compliance reports or with the index indexation requirements such as a GRI. She's an economist. Uh, she has a diploma of uh, corporate governance and a professor of uh, climate change at University of Chile. Please be welcome. Thank you, Joanna, for uh, the opportunity. Thank you all, those of you who uh, spoke before me. I'm going to use part of what you said already. Uh, I'm going to start sharing. I will talk about uh, what's coming in terms of ASG factors in the salmon industry. Today, uh, I'd like to talk about three issues, what has been said, or what is being done, and what's coming. But uh, to talk about what has been said, uh, I will extend you an invitation, please, in your mobile phones, visit uh, www.menti.com. It's an 
app and we're going to do an online survey and I hope uh, I will not cause uh, any confusion. If you can access menti.com and use this code 3189951. And one. I'd like to know your opinion about what are the expressions and the biases and opinions, everything that has been said about the salmon industry in Chile. Once again, the code is 3189951. I'm going to stop showing this uh, screen. I'm going to show you now. Oh, I'm going back to my presentation now. So you can see the result. Please let, let me know. Uh, if you can see the presentation, great. Uh, we already have some results. Basically, what which expressions uh, have you heard already about the salmon industry in Chile? You can choose any of the six options. The first one, if overpopulation of salmons in uh, would cause uh, virus outbreaks in the marine fauna. That, Chilean industry is marked up by the excessive use of antibiotics, which seems to be the strongest uh, view. Mm. Farming uh, of salmon creates anaerobic conditions in water, uh, preventing life from thriving in the sea. The fourth one, uh, the farms uh, are um, covering pristine areas, uh, having an impact on biodiversity in the world. Fifth option. The salmon industry is responsible for the deterioration of uh, artisanal uh, fishing in Chile. And finally, uh, the escapes of, of salmon that create uh, an accelerated reduction of native species that are already under threat. I will give you five more seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, we have 41 people, 42 people voting about uh, the use of antibiotics, for example. Now, countdown five, four, three, two, one. And that's it. Let's go back to the presentation now. I don't know if you could see. Will you please confirm if you were able to see the charts? No. That's the fun part of all this. Okay. Let's see now. Here. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Great. So these are the results. Uh, mainly what is said, thank you for those of you who are still voting, is about the excessive use of antibiotics. And the second uh, highest uh, result uh, is about the scapes and the impact of the scape of salmon from the farms uh, and their impact on the native species. I'm going to uh, stop sharing, going back to my presentation now. if I can make this work. Okay, I will go back to my original presentation. Uh, this would not be a consulting presentation without a PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Uh, why did I ask you uh, to use this voting system to get to know your opinion? Basically, because uh, everything that is said uh, is not new. Um, uh, we still have some examples, especially of escapes, but uh, much of what is said is also based on things from the past of this industry uh, that has evolved, that has changed, uh, it, and that is still evolving. And of course, it does require m many more breakthroughs and, and we'll see much of what's coming, what is being done in Norway, in, in Scotland, in Canada. Uh, but let me talk about what uh, the Chilean salmon industry is doing today. What happens with the farms themselves? Yes, there have been escapes. And of course, uh, uh, producers are trying to reinforce uh, the floating uh, containers that they are trying to apply uh, on land uh, farms in Chile. And some, some investors are, are thinking of that also. And there are also uh, initiatives to clean pristine areas. Um, uh, um, there have been instances in which no deterioration has been identified uh, or impact of uh, the activity on the beaches. We are doing things. Why antibiotics are necessary? 
Well, because unlike uh, what happens with um, Norwegian water in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Chilean waters are a little bit uh, warmer and they are subject to the presence of uh, bacteria. Up there, there's viruses that here, uh, bacteria are present and the use of antibiotics come, it's been it's coming down significantly since 2015. And uh, there are periods uh, in which uh, we they let the antibiotic to disappear from the structure from the muscle of the salmon before uh, they are uh, put out for human consumption. The salmon diet, uh, how healthy this is. Well, thankfully, compared to the past, that the 60% of the salmon diet is from vegetal origin. Five years ago, uh, an NGO said that uh, some salmon farming in Chile will never be sustainable because it requires a much more protein than what uh, the protein that it produces and that in order to produce one kilo salmon close to five kilos of uh, wild fishing is required uh, that's changing 60 percent of uh, salmon uh, diet it comes from the vegetal uh, protein soybean is being used uh, that is imported uh, but there are national products as well uh, uh, lupine, uh, wheat, uh, gluten, and that is also part of the agricultural policies that are established in Chile. And finally, uh, compared also adding algae, etc. And finally, about the scapes, mm, there's still escapes. Yes, of course, they exist. Escapes account for less than 1%, is 0.2% of annual harvests. In the last decade, especially in 2020, uh, we've seen a uh, dramatic reduction, equivalent to 9% uh, compared to the uh, escapes in the last decade. And also there's a bill of law that is being discussed in parliament dealing with um, hardening or strengthening uh, legislation regarding uh, escapes, because it, it is a problem for everybody, of course, uh, with the intent of improving uh, safety of the structures, uh, reaction plans, and fines in case of escape. Yes, there are certain biases. There are certain things, uh, uh, 45 of you or 30 of you consider this to be still a problem for the industry, but the industry is working on it. It's trying to make changes and to evolve. And it is, um, I'd like to discuss these changes, what's coming. And as part of what's coming as now in the e ASG, environmental, social and governance uh, aspect, I'd like to highlight uh, the distribution and farming practices, biotechnology development, uh, that is part of the environmental context uh, of ASG, human capital, social aspects, and also the regulatory framework uh, as part of the governance aspects. So as to, as to what is considered uh, as distribution and farming practices, Eric mentioned this. Uh, what we see in the future uh, in these areas here is uh, different practices uh, that can be implemented. In orange, salmon uh, uh, almost represent areas that were uh, new technologies, HFC technologies. Uh, HFC are hybrid flow through system. It's a system that uses uh, 30 to 35 percent of water from the ocean. Uh, and the rest is uh, recycled water uh, in or recirculated water in order to improve water flow, to improve oxygenation in the water, but also it enables a better control of organic uh, waste and other quality of the salmon. And this is possible in the northern and central Chile. Uh, in this part uh, represents uh, offshore production. high seas and in blue in Chile represent um, a, a small part is less and less uh, in a small part in southern Australia north of Europe as well and south of Chile as well uh, conventional farming but the idea is to change is it, 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 it try to uh, have closed or semi-closed uh, facilities and also land-based uh, farming this, this, it is not new, of course, to hear that uh, 
uh, shrinking uh, the uh, carbon footprint is something that we need to do in regardless of uh, the industry, energy, trade, transportation, uh, mining, salmon. This is what's coming. Well, it's here already and um, for, for the salmon industry, but this is the same and we need to implement uh, practices and techniques that will allow us to reduce uh, the carbon footprint either through uh, waste management uh, or managing the uh, uh, supply chain, uh, etc. And finally, uh, digital traceability. The traceability concept, uh, all of the information that a consumer or that the market requires uh, uh, to understand uh, how a product has been produced, in this case, uh, salmon, for example, uh, either land-based or, or what is the production system that was used, uh, closed, semi-closed, etc. What type of feed, uh, what was uh, the uh, logistics and uh, uh, supply chain Mario talked about the importance of traceability for markets and for investors to guarantee that, that they are going to invest on uh, companies and industries that have healthy and sustainable practices. Traceability goes beyond that. It's important for me as a consumer to guarantee the quality of what I'm uh, eating uh, and what I cook for my child. You become what you eat. Uh, so traceability is also important. And as, as, as part of the biotechnology uh, development uh, in uh, salmon species, what we see, what it's coming stronger and stronger is the combination of genetics, uh, vaccines, uh, a more a healthier uh, uh, diet, uh, which will result in uh, sterile uh, and healthier salmon well, with no impact on um, wild salmon. M many of the salmon species uh, that have been introduced in Chile come from urine. That's why there is so con this conflict with the Chilean species. So this mix between genetics, vaccines, and uh, nutrition will have an impact uh, on the event of escapes. Then, a little bit more about uh, closed or semi-closed uh, facilities uh, that Eric mentioned that must uh, reduce part of the biological exposure, particularly because of this allows us to capture and track uh, uh, all the uh, deposits or waste coming from uh, the food or feed of salmon and of uh, the activity itself. And finally, diet. We talked about this already, uh, uh, John also talked about the importance uh, of salmon as an alternative protein source, uh, uh, fatty acids. And most importantly is the new ingredients that are used in um, uh, feeding uh, uh, with the concentration of uh, proteins and omega-3. As a consequence of the change in salmon uh, feed, we'll also be uh, consuming and eating healthier salmon. In fact, this creates a link with the uh, Next topic, uh, the social aspect, uh, uh, the human capital part, uh, which is the need uh, for a, a investment on uh, training marine biologists, economists, and other professionals uh, that uh, manage uh, salmon uh, companies, salmon farming companies, so they can understand that they need to uh, tap into all technology the technology innovation, the use of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the use of other uh, farming techniques and uh, different types of feed. This human capital needs to be available, needs to be trained and educated by the industry for the industry to improve uh, uh, the quality of the salmon that is produced and that we eat. Mm, it, it, it is not a third party responsibility. It is a responsibility of this industry as well uh, to enable the access to training and to uh, uh, courses in Chile or abroad. Uh, to cause uh, the uh, knowledge of this industry to become part of the institutional arrangement uh, throughout the entire life cycle of the salmon to capture data that can inform uh, and also train people 
and to improve uh, the production techniques. It is extremely important. Uh, people who really know how to use data in order to improve production, it's absolutely necessary. And finally, final, last but not least, to invest more on industrial uh, R&D, to invest on uh, research uh, uh, to address um, biological uh, issues that we see today. And finally, uh, the G part, governance uh, side of things, I'm going to translate this uh, uh, regulatory framework, which is something a bit controversial, I would say. Sometimes you think that having a strong and sound regulatory framework is uh, a barrier to the development of an industry. Not necessarily. Uh, regulatory frameworks are useful to define what can be allowed, what's acceptable, uh, goals, milestones that we need to comply with, especially talking about climate change. Uh, regulatory frameworks uh, must be present, uh, of course, in order to promote and to try to uh, drive the changes that any industry must um, undergo uh, to be sustainable, uh, to reduce its impact on climate change and to reduce the impact, such as the case of the uh, food industry, the impact on people. So what we're going to see and that is already happening many places in the world and Norway is a good example, is a change in regulations and policies in order to manage uh, production licenses. And I'm not saying here that Chile needs to adopt a, a quota system, uh, but uh, to understand uh, how to how licenses are granted, uh, uh, who, what should a company comply with in order to get a license? And of course, if they do not comply, uh, there, there needs to be restrictions imposed. Regulatory frameworks, as I said, uh, must emphasize on the importance of reducing the environmental footprint. In Europe, for example, we see that they're considering the possibility of introducing uh, a carbon uh, tax on products that arrive in uh, Europe. And, and if they don't comply with those uh, goals, well, it's licenses are not granted. It's not the case of Salma because the European market is not the cons biggest consumer of Chilean Salma, but for other products, there will be an impact. But there will be also benefits. And finally, regulations, uh, techniques, and practices that allow for a more dynamic alerts used on using technology, uh, allowing for the use of reporting and information and data uh, in real time. Uh, information uh, that is correct, uh, that has not been manipulated, and that allows to identify certain thresholds, lower and lower thresholds, uh, and more aligned with the regulatory framework about when, when something is not doing right at any type or a time of or during the chain. And I'm closing with this. The most important thing is to understand that any industry has certain challenges. Uh, climate change, uh, as well as uh, the social unrest and the COVID pandemic have accelerated the urgency uh, of change in the social context and the climate context for the salmon industry is the same. What we see is that um, more than implementing the changes in terms of production itself, the change needs to be a mindset change. The change needs to be needs to happen in people, people or that are part of that industry to understand that this current model, either in Chile, Canada, Scotland, or Norway, is not sustainable anymore. Uh, it is to it is to think uh, ten years ahead. What will be the industry like in twenty more years, uh, and try to implement and plan and to look for the investments, uh, but now and to look for investors and investments. We need to be transparent with the information in order to have transparent information. We need to invest on data management and we need to invest on human capital. And hopefully uh, uh, all of this is supported by a regulatory framework uh, that is robust, but uh, that it doesn't become an obstacle to the industry. Uh, let's talk about this at the end uh, during the Q&A, but thank you. Thank you, Alana. An interesting presentation and listening what are the challenges of the industry and what companies are doing to address them through innovation and technology development. In closing, Alicia Dominguez, she's a lawyer from the University of Chile with a long background as a 
tax uh, advisor in uh, domestic and foreign companies in mining and our industry, which distinguishes uh, one of the most reputable professionals in the country. And Tumpers and Partners and Chairs Clyde, as she was uh, uh, recognized as one of the leading uh, tax lawyers in Chile. Alicia, thank you, Joanna for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. I uh, will discuss three main ideas on tax uh, reality and a final a recommendation on, on the current situation and uh, potential investments. The first topic I would like to address with you is uh, certain uh, uh, tax trends, tax changes, tax amendments will continue to go on. As you know, in the last 20 years, there has been significant uh, tax uh, regulation changes. Um, 2014 and 2020 were probably the most, uh, the deepest uh, uh, changes. And we have to bear in mind that Chile even given the internal domestic requirements and follow international recommendations, mainly from uh, OCDE and uh, World Bank, uh, has been looking and will continue to look for a greater uh, tax collection. Under the umbrella of uh, streamlined uh, legislation, but also coordinated and aligned uh, international, well aligned internationally, all that within a regular framework that uh, along with provide for certainty to taxpayers will also encourage them to invest. As you see, it's, uh, it's a very ambitious uh, goal, which is not that, that in order to achieve this, this will be has to be discussed uh, thoroughly, not only technically speaking, but political discussions with all the risks that may that that may entail. According to our constitution here in Chile, the government and, the, and Congress are co-legislators. That is, the government uh, will make a suggestion, and the. Uh, Congress will enact the law. So we have to bear in mind that the ideal situation is for these changes to be thoroughly analyzed and, and implemented quite prudently. But today we are highly uh, hypersensitive uh, in social uh, aspects because of the social unrest uh, in October 2019. We have a we have a precarious uh, economic uh, situation because of the pandemics and under a lot of pressure to uh, quickly legislate and to make new changes to increase tax collection. But we have to be very careful legislating and making changes uh, uh, with a, a short uh, sight of you. Despite we still have a high tax evasion rate nearly 7.6% uh, of our GDP still have, uh, I mean, we're far from uh, tax, international tax collection standards according to the OCDE standards, measured as a uh, uh, tax burden as a function of the GDP. Our uh, numbers in terms of um, social equity or equality, social equality are, even after tax, are still lagging behind the expectations. So the first thing I want to say, the first trend that we have to bear in mind is that regulatory changes will continue to appear. The second topic, unfortunately, I don't see what is uh, uh, happening with my presentation, I don't, I don't know if you are actually showing the uh, slides. But um, like I said, three main ideas, uh, uh, three main ideas, and a final recommendation. First idea is uh, regulatory changes and how these will continue to be so, and what conditions should they have. And the second aspect is the 
the role of technology in this transformation, both uh, for the tax authority and the taxpayer level. But let me focus on taxpayers in terms of, uh, I'm not, I mean, no, I, I mean on the impact on taxpayers, this technology revolution of our tax authority, our uh, IRS, the Chilean IRS is, uh, has, uh, is become the leader in terms of technology. The digitalization, uh, it's a reality, it's here. Our relationship with the IRS is 100% uh, digital. Uh, taxpayers and the fiscal authority, we worked online on nearly 100% of, 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 of the our tax compliance activities. But we have to bear in mind that this technology revolution has an impact on the fact that the IRS today has the ability to process, to cross-check uh, 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 a myriad of uh, the taxpayer data by segmenting and having data on taxpayers, economic groups, economic segments, different industries. Therefore, today, uh, the design of inspection or monitoring programs use these artificial intelligence and focused on tax payers with a higher uh, non-compliance risk. The, the director of IRS said that over a billion dollars are expected to be collected only by these uh, greater control, less evasion program that using artificial intelligence in order to focus on the design of a monitoring program. One third, a third element, a third idea I'd like to share with you today on uh, tax reality is a good news. Our regulatory framework today uh, after the 2020 reform is more empathetic uh, with the reality of businesses and taxpayers. Let me emphasize one of the things. Uh, there are several topics. One of the aspects that, that deals with uh, exp expenditure. In, 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 in our tax framework, we have a new concept of necessary expenditure to generate revenues, much more modern and updated, aligned to the risks that uh, businesses face compared to the concept we used to have two years ago. Also, on, on these topics uh, today in Chile, uh, legal mandate is, that, uh, is accepted that the uh, uh, corporate social responsibility expenditure are deductible, tax deductible. We also have today rules on uh, of uh, write-offs, which are more, say, flexible than what we used to have. There's also an important issue which has been added to the legislation dealing with uh, compensations uh, for uh, objective responsibility losses. This is interesting because we will see whether the, the, the new fishing uh, law together with the new tax structure will allow, for instance, fines and payments to be made as a result of fish scape, uh, whether they are a necessary expense to produce revenue because these are uh, inherent to the industry. We've been discussing this with the uh, uh, SOM board, but uh, we will see how this uh, goes ahead. Um, also, uh, transaction payments. I mean, my, my point is that, that today we have a, a tax uh, framework uh, connected to uh, expenses, which is far more empathetic to the reality of businesses and the risks for taxpayers. And, and then uh, uh, the, uh, we should revisit this to see how can you play and get a benefit out of, out of uh, this. Last but not least, uh, today's situation. A recommendation is that there are uh, 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 rules and regulations that will be valid in, until December 2022, promoting investment in capital goods, not only tangible, but also intangible, so that the, the acquisition of uh, fixed assets uh, till uh, December 31st, 2022 will be 100% uh, deductible as an expense. Uh, I believe boards here will uh, 
uh, congratulate uh, those uh, teams of doing the job of revisiting these new investment incentive uh, rules and regulations to see whether some uh, good use may be, uh, may be that. This is what I had for you. Uh, the reality of uh, regulatory changes, uh, why they take place, why they are so challenging. A second topic, uh, which is the, uh, the transformation role of technology and uh, artificial intelligence and how these is uh, being used by the authorities and the uh, companies have to properly plan uh, uh, to, to, to comply with the requirements and not only protect the economic results or economic performance, but also the reputation of the company. And the third topic that had to do with this new regulation in terms of uh, expenditures, which is more empathetic with the corporate reali reality. And the last piece of advice, which is looking and quantifying the benefits of uh, a uh, of a of a use of these uh, non-permanent uh, investment uh, regimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, for your presentation. Clear as always. I'd like, I'd like to thank all those speakers and uh, and that we'll now go into the Q and A. I'd like to start with Eric. The first question, Eric, is. Uh, what do you think will be in the future state uh, of the salmon industry in 20 years? And um, how much of the production you think will be land-based production? Hello. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. And uh, of course, uh, looking into the kind of crystal ball here is, um, it's something that a lot of in investors now are, are are also asking themselves and, and wanting the, the the answer to. Uh, we think, uh, uh, as I said, um, both offshore and land based are quite in a pilot phase. Land based somewhat more uh, kind of uh, ahead due to more projects uh, on that based. I think. Uh, Land-based will play a major role in the future, uh, and what we do not know today is that if the technology and kind of is will be sound enough in order to uh, have uh, installations on land uh, where you can grow uh, salmon up to harvesting weights of let's say between four to six kilos uh, at at, the, at an acceptable risk because um, uh, as we all know the larger the fish you, you grow the fish in the pens or in the land based installation the more values are at risk so uh, when growing up from let's say two uh, and from uh, and upwards to five ki uh, six kilos you also uh, face a bigger loss a financial loss if there are mortalities or kind of closed stones um, of, uh, of that installation. Uh, we think uh, it will uh, grow up to, uh, let's say, between 1.2 uh, million and uh, 1.5 million tons at least, um, uh, looking 20 years ahead. We must, I, I think the, the greatest challenge is actually one thing is the capital, but also it's to gain knowledge. And these projects have a lead time, uh, both in being uh, engineered, being uh, having the necessary uh, permits, and also being kind of installed and constructed. And from there, you will also have a period uh, of some years until you have harvest uh, ready uh, salmon. But uh, we think they it will supplement in a good way uh, at least we think 1 million uh, tons plus but if this uh, technology really proves sustainable uh, financially and uh, production wise it can also increase uh, beyond that yes thank you eric Thank you. Thank you for your answer. 
now for Mario, uh, a question for him. Uh, how do you assess the importance uh, of information? Um, or, or what, what value do you think the market sees in, in sustainability reports, for example? Just like um, financial reports, do you think that the market values the fact that sustainability information is reported? Thank you for the question, Joanna. And I believe uh, I'd, I'd say that the answer is yes. Um, capital markets, investors and customers, um, they need more and more information about the companies, uh, getting to know what are the products that are being uh, acquired. And as I said in the presentation, uh, how a company is being measured uh, is not only considering future cash flow, but its relationship with the environment. Uh, and these uh, added factors that come in uh, sustainability reports. Sustainability reporting is very important, uh, but uh, what I'd like to communicate is that these sustainability reports must go hand in hand with the financial reports and be consistent with it because you cannot see them in isolation, independent from each other. A question for uh, Elane, uh, implementing standards for social aspects uh, and human capital standards and uh, environment, uh, do you think it's possible to balance uh, regulation, uh, sustainable uh, production, uh, and uh, to allow for the growth of the activity in a sustainable manner? Well, that's a big question that or, or companies are trying to, to answer today and leaders are trying to answer today. It is possible, it is necessary, and it's mandatory. There's no other way uh, except for uh, identifying what is the impact. Each industry, not only some industry, what is the impact of uh, climate change? What investments do I need to make in order to keep operating, but in a sustainable manner? Um, governments and regulators have a major role to play in terms of understanding uh, the industry, um, what um, can be demanded from the industry, and to support also with inspections and even fines, because sometimes there there needs to be some kind of penalty for the wrongdoing or the mistakes. This is what needs to be done. And as I said before in my presentation, uh, those who are leading the industry must understand that is a paradigm shift, and that is the direction we're going the whole planet, the whole market, uh, there's no other choice. But uh, what, I, what I said today about uh, what's coming really does not represent such a distant uh, future. Many of those practices are already here in Chile. Uh, the major difference is that best practices in, in social aspects or the environment, uh, they must be the rule, not the exception. And that is a major difference. Uh, have having all this uh, implemented across the border for the whole industry will make a difference uh, for the salmon industry in Chile. Thank you, Elane. And the last question, because of the time restraints for Alicia, considering uh, the very hard year that we've gone through facing a pandemic and the need for funding and financing, do you think that there will be uh, tax changes or or changes in terms of tax benefits that m might be implemented that may impact the industry? Mm, are tax in changes that may uh, impact the industry negatively? No, but there's an important change that is significant for the industry, which is the Ley Austral, the Navarino Act. Uh, there are incentives to investments in our southernmost uh, areas, and those uh, acts or laws were not uh, um, commented on negatively by OECD and the World Bank report. Uh, they did a review of all the tax exemptions and special regimes. And these two acts, uh, the Navarino Act uh, and the uh, Austral Act, uh, were not touched, and even more so. The good news is that um, the tax reform of 2020 extended or expanded uh, the use of uh, this act until 2055, both uh, acts, uh, Austral and Navarino acts. Uh, I 
do not see any uh, anything else, uh, Joanna, uh, uh, of this specific topic. And something we need to look at is uh, expenses, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility that we've discussed today, and uh, this uh, also addressing the inherent risks. For example, escapes of fish. Uh, these are topics that uh, the industry needs to address. Uh, thank you, Alicia. So I'd like to thank the speakers. I think it's been uh, very interesting to hear about the challenges, how companies have uh, turned these challenges uh, into opportunities uh, through technology and innovation, what are the trends for the future, and how can you make production uh, with its value and employment compatible with a new uh, care for the environment uh, through um, economic, social, uh, I'd like to Eric, um, Mario, Elane, Alicia, uh, the Salmon Council, and uh, thank you all for participating as well. Thank you very much.